Welcome to Trash Radio. What is security culture? A guide to staying safe. This is a reprint of a guide called What is Security Culture? published by the Crime Think Inc. Collective. As far as we know, it first appeared in their book Recipes for Disaster, an anarchist cookbook, and then appeared in a slightly updated form in 2009 on their website, crimethinkinc.com. We're reprinting this because the information contained within cannot be shared enough within our communities. Over the past several years, we've seen various instances of anarchists getting serious federal charges. Eric McDavid was entrapped by a federal informant, Anna with whom he hatched a plot to blow up a dam and was later sentenced to several years in prison. At the 2008 protests against the Republican National Convention, several folks were entrapped by federal informants. Bradley Crowder, David McKay, and Matthew De Palma. While one certainly can't say that more easily accessible information on security culture would have prevented these situations, it seems that the more widely available the information is, the safer we will all be. We choose to reprint this guide specifically because it focuses on general principles rather than specific tactics necessary to building secure communities of resistance. Please read this guide, share it, enact these principles in your life, and explain them to people who aren't familiar with them. Most importantly, please take security culture seriously. What is security culture? What is security culture? A security culture is a set of customs shared by a community whose members may be targeted by the government, designated to minimize risk. Having a security culture in place saves everyone the trouble of having to work out safety measures over and over from scratch and can help offset paranoia and panic in stressful situations. Hell, it might even keep you out of prison too. The difference between protocol and culture is that culture becomes unconscious, instinctive, and thus effortless. Once the safest possible behavior has become habitual for everyone in the circles in which you travel, you can spend less time and energy emphasizing the need for it or suffering the consequences of not having it, or worrying about how much danger you're in. As you'll know, you're already doing everything you can to be careful. If you're in the habit of not giving away anything sensitive about yourself, you can collaborate with strangers without having to agonize about whether or not they are informers. If everyone knows what not to talk about over the telephone, your enemies can tap the line all they want 
and it won't get them anywhere. Don't ask. Don't tell. Don't ask others to share confidential information you don't need to know. Don't brag about illegal things you or others have done, or mention things that are going to happen or might happen, or even refer to another person's interest in being involved in such activities. Stay aware wherever you speak. Don't let chance illusions drop out thoughtlessly. You can say no at any time to anyone about anything. If captured, never ever give up any information that could endanger anyone else. Some recommend an explicit oath be sworn by all participants in a direct action group. That way, in a worst case scenario, when pressure might make it hard to distinguish between giving up a few harmless details and totally selling out, everyone will know exactly what commitments they made to each other. Don't make it too easy for your enemies to figure out what you're up to. Don't be too predictable in the methods you employ or the targets you choose or the times and places you meet to discuss things. Don't be too visible in the public aspects of the struggle in which you do your most serious direct action. Keep your name off mailing lists and out of the media. Perhaps avoid association with above-ground organizations and campaigns entirely. If you're involved with really serious clandestine activities with a few comrades, you may want to limit your interactions in public, if not avoid each other altogether. Federal agents can easily get access to the phone numbers dialed from your phone and will use such lists to establish connections between individuals the same goes for your email and the books you check out from libraries and especially social networking sites like Facebook. Don't leave a trail. Credit card use, gas cards, cell phone cards all leave a record of your motions purchases, and contacts. Have a cover story supported by verifiable facts if you might need one. Be careful about what your trash could reveal about you. Dropouts aren't the only ones who go dumpstering. Keep track of every written document an incriminating photocopy. Keep them all in one place so you can't accidentally forge one and destroy them as soon as you don't need them. The fewer there are in the first place, the better. Get used to using your memory. Make sure there aren't any ghosts of such writing left behind in impressions on the surfaces you were writing on, whether these be wooden desks or pads of paper. Assume that every use of computers leaves a trail, too. Don't throw any direct action ideas around in public 
that you think might want to try at some point. Wait to propose an idea until you can gather a group of individuals that you expect will all be interested in trying it. The exception is the bosom companion with whom you brainstorm and hash out details in advance, safely outside your home and away from mixed company, of course. Don't propose your idea until you think the time is right for it to be tried. Invite only those you are pretty certain will want to join in. Everyone you invite who doesn't end up participating is a needless security risk, and this can be doubly problematic. If it turns out they feel your proposed activity is laughably dumb or morally wrong, only invite people who can keep secrets. This is critical whether or not they decide to participate. Develop methods to establish the security level of a group or situation. You don't want a place that can be monitored. No private residences. You don't want a place where you can be observed altogether not the park across from the site of the next day's actions. And you don't want a place where you can be seen entering and leaving, or that someone could enter unexpectedly. Post scouts, lock the door once things get started. Watch for anything suspicious. Small groups can take walks and chat. Larger groups can meet in quiet outdoor settings, go hiking or camping if there's time, or in private rooms in public buildings, such as a library study room or empty classrooms. Best case scenario, Though he has no idea you're involved in direct action, you're close with the old guy who runs the cafe across town, and he doesn't mind letting you have the back room one afternoon for a private party. No questions asked. Be aware of the reliability of those around you especially those with whom you might collaborate in underground activities. Be conscious of how long you've known people, how far back their involvement in your community and their lives outside of it can be traced, and what others' experiences with them have been. The friends you grew up with, if you still have any of them in your life, may be the best companions for direct action, as you are familiar with their strengths and weaknesses and the ways they handle pressure, and you know for a fact they are who they say they are. Make sure only to trust your safety and the safety of your projects to level-headed folks who share the same priorities and commitments and have nothing to prove. In the long term, strive to build up a community of people with long-standing friendships and experience acting together with ties to other such communities.
don't get too distracted worrying about whether people are infiltrators or not. If your security measures are effective, it shouldn't even matter. Learn and abide by the security expectations of each person you interact with and respect differences in style. To collaborate with others, you have to make sure they feel at home with you, even if you're not collaborating with them. You don't want to make them uncomfortable or disregard a danger they understand better than you. When it comes to planning direct action, not abiding by the security culture accepted in a given community can wreck not only your chances to cooperate with others on a project, but the possibility of the project happening at all. For example, if you bring up an idea others were planning to try in a setting they deem insecure, they may be forced to abandon the plan as it may now be associated with them. Ask people to outline for you their specific security needs before you even broach the subject of direct action. Let others know exactly what your needs are when it comes to security. The corollary of abiding by others' expectations is that you must make it easy for others to abide by yours. At the beginning of any relationship in which your private political life may become an issue, emphasize that there are details of your activities that you need to keep to yourself. This can save you a lot of drama in situations that are already stressful enough. The last thing you need on returning from a secret mission gone wrong is to end up in a fight with your lover. Quote, But if you trusted me, you would tell me about this. How do I know you're not out there sleeping with... End quote. It's not a matter of trust. Sensitive information isn't a reward to be earned or deserved. Look out for other people. Make explicit to those around you what risks you may pose to them with your presence or with actions you have planned, at least as much as you're able to without violating other precepts of security culture. Let them know to the extent you're able what risks you run yourself. For example, whether you can afford to be arrested, if there are outstanding warrants for you, if you are an undocumented migrant, etc. What responsibilities you have to keep up with, whether you have any allergies. Don't imperil others with your decisions, especially if you're not able to provide concrete support should they somehow get arrested and charged on account of your behavior. If someone else drops a banner in an area immediately adjacent to a fire you set, the police might charge them with arson, even if the charges can't stick. 
You don't want to risk their ill will or accidentally block their planned escape route. If you help initiate a breakaway march that leaves the permitted zone, try to make sure you keep your body between the police and others who have come along but don't necessarily understand the risks involved. If you escalate a spontaneous parade by engaging in property destruction, make sure others who were unprepared for this are not still standing around in confusion when the police show up. Whatever risky projects you undertake, make sure you're prepared to go about them intelligently so no one else will have to run unexpected risks to help you out when you make mistakes. Security culture is a form of etiquette, a way to avoid needless misunderstandings and potentially disastrous conflicts. Security concerns should never be an excuse for making others feel left out or inferior, though it can take some finesse to avoid that. Just as no one should feel they have a right to be in on anything others prefer to keep to themselves, those who violate the security culture of their communities should not be rebuked too harshly the first time. This isn't a question of being hip enough to activist decorum to join the in-group, but of establishing group expectations and gently helping people understand their importance. Besides, people are least able to absorb constructive criticism when they're put on the defensive. Nevertheless, such people should always be told immediately how they're putting others at risk and what the consequences will be should they continue to. Those who can't grasp this must be tactfully but effectively shut out of all sensitive situations. Security culture is not paranoia institutionalized, but a way to avoid unhealthy paranoia by minimizing risks ahead of time. It is counterproductive to spend more energy worrying about how much surveillance you are under than is useful for decreasing the danger it poses. Just as it is debilitating to be constantly second-guessing your precautions and doubting the authenticity of potential comrades. A good security culture should make everyone feel more relaxed and confident, not less. At the same time, it's equally unproductive to accuse those who adhere to security measures stricter than yours of being paranoid. Remember, our enemies are out to get us. Don't let suspicion be used against you. If your foes can't learn your secrets, they will settle for turning you against each other. Undercover agents can spread rumors or throw around accusations to create dissension, mistrust, and resentment inside of or between groups. They may falsify letters or take similar steps to frame activists. The mainstream media can participate in this by reporting that there is an informant in a group when there is not one or misrepresenting the politics or history of an individual or group in order to alienate potential allies, or emphasizing over and over 
that there is a conflict between two branches of a movement until they really do mistrust one another. Again, a shrewd security culture that fosters an appropriately high level of trust and confidence should make such provocations nearly impossible on the personal level. When it comes to relations between proponents of different tactics and organizations of different stripes, remember the importance of solidarity and diversity of tactics and to trust that others do too, even if media accounts suggest otherwise. Don't accept rumors or reports as facts. I can't see what you're doing. Let's go. Go to the source for confirmation every time and be diplomatic about it. Don't be intimidated by bluffing. Police attention and surveillance is not necessarily an indication that they know anything specific about your plans or activities. Often, it indicates they do not and are trying to frighten you out of continuing with them. Develop an instinct with which to sense when your cover has actually been blown and when your enemies are just trying to distress you into doing their work for them. Always be prepared for the possibility that you are under observation, but don't mistake attracting surveillance for being effective. Even if everything you are doing is perfectly legal, you may still receive attention and harassment from intelligence organizations if they feel you pose an inconvenience to their masters. In some regards, this can be for the best. The more they have to monitor, the more thinly spread their energies are, and the harder it is for them to pinpoint and neutralize subversives. At the same time, don't get caught up in the excitement of being under surveillance and begin to assume that the more the authorities pay attention to you, the more dangerous to them you must be. They're not that smart. They tend to be preoccupied with the resistance organizations whose approaches most resemble their own. Take advantage of this. The best tactics are the ones that reach people, make points, and exert leverage while not showing up on the radar of the powers that be, at least not until it is too late. Ideally, your activities should be well known to everyone except the authorities. Security culture involves a code of silence, but it is not a code of voicelessness. The stories of our daring exploits and the struggle against capitalism must be told somehow, so everyone will know resistance is a real possibility put into motion by real people. Open incitements to insurrection must be made so would-be revolutionaries can find each other and the revolutionary sentiments buried in the hearts of the masses find their way to the surface. A good security culture should preserve as much secrecy as is necessary for the individuals to be safe and their underground activities while still providing visibility for radical perspectives. Most of the security tradition in the activist milieu today 
is derived from the past 30 years of animal rights and earth liberation activities. As such, it's perfectly suited for the needs of small groups carrying out isolated illegal acts, but isn't always appropriate for more above-ground campaigns aimed at encouraging generalized insubordination. In some cases, it can make sense to break the law openly in order to provoke the participation of a large mass that can then provide safety in numbers. Balance the need to escape detection by your enemies against the need to be accessible to potential friends. In the long run, secrecy alone cannot protect us. Sooner or later, they're going to find all of us. And if no one else understands what we're doing and what we want, they'll be able to liquidate us with impunity. Only the power of an informed and sympathetic and hopefully similarly equipped public can help us then. There should always be entryways into communities in which direct action is practiced so more and more people can join in. Those doing really serious stuff should keep it to themselves, of course. But every community should also have a person or two who vocally advocates and educates about direct action and who can discreetly help trustworthy novices link up with others to get started. When you're planning an action, begin by establishing the security level appropriate to it and act accordingly from there on. Learning to gauge the risks posed by an activity or situation and how to deal with them appropriately is not just a crucial part of staying out of jail. It also helps to know what you're not worried about so you don't waste energy on unwarranted, cumbersome security measures. Keep in mind that a given action may have different aspects that demand different degrees of security. Make sure to keep these distinct. Here's an example of a possible rating system for security levels. One, only those who are directly involved in on the action know of its existence. Two, trusted support persons also known about the action, but everyone in the group decides together who these will be. 3. It is acceptable for the group to invite people to participate who might choose not to. That is, some outside the group may know about the action, but are still expected to keep it a secret. 4. The group does not set a strict list of who is invited. Participants are free to invite others and encourage them to do the same, while emphasizing that knowledge of the action is to be kept within the circles of those who can be trusted with secrets. 5. Rumors of an action can be spread far and wide through the community, but the identities of those at the center of the organizing are to be kept a secret. 6. The action is announced openly, but with at least some degree of discretion, 
so as to not tip off the sleepier of the authorities. 7. The action is totally announced and above ground in all ways. To give examples, security level 1 would be appropriate for a group planning to firebomb an SUV dealership, while level 2 would be acceptable for those planning more minor acts of property destruction, such as spray painting. Level 3 or 4 would be appropriate for calling a spokes council preceding a black block at a large demonstration or for a group planning to do a newspaper wrap depending on the ratio of risk versus need for numbers. Level 5 would be perfect for a project such as initiating a surprise unpermitted march. For example, everyone hears in advance that the Annie DeFranco performance is going to end in a spontaneous anti-war march, so people can prepare accordingly. But as no one knows whose idea it is, no one can be targeted as an organizer. Level 6 would be appropriate for announcing a critical mass bicycle ride. Flyers are wrapped around the handlebars of every civilian bicycle, but no announcements are sent to the papers, so the cops won't be there at the beginning while the mass is still vulnerable. Level 7 is appropriate for a permitted anti-war march or independent media video screening, unless you're so dysfunctionally paranoid you even want to keep community outreach projects a secret. It also makes sense to choose the means of communicating you will use according to the levels of security demanded. Here's an example of different levels of communication security corresponding to the system just outlined above. 1. No communication about the action except in person outside the homes of those involved in surveillance-free environments. Example, the group goes camping to discuss plans. No discussion of the action except when it is absolutely necessary. Two, outside group meetings, involved individuals are here to discuss the action in surveillance-free spaces. 3. Discussions are permitted in the homes, not definitely under surveillance. 4. Communication by encrypted email or on neutral telephone lines is acceptable. 5. People can speak about the action over telephones, email, etc., provided they're careful not to give away certain details who, what, when, where. 6. Telephones, email, etc., are all fair game. Email list servers, flyering in public spaces, announcements to newspapers, etc., may or may not be acceptable on a case by case basis. 7. Communication 
and proclamation by every possible medium are encouraged. If you keep hazardous information out of circulation and you follow suitable security measures in every project you undertake, you'll be well on your way to fulfilling what early Crime Think Incorporated agent Abby Hoffman described as the first duty of the revolutionary, not getting caught. All the best in your adventures and misadventures. And remember, you didn't hear it from us. Anatomy of the Heads. It's like the news. If the news were memories of warriors dismembering a golem made of spray on tan and talking points, then an Amazon shows up and dances over remains of the golem's harem of mud women. Hollywood Confessions by Moonpay A few years after Kurt Cobain was gone, I ate Courtney Love out and that bitch tasted nasty. It wasn't like a fish smell. It tasted like dead flesh. I've never told anyone about it. The only time that I got donations for that at that space was the first day, Sunday, $10 out of 200. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and I was out there. And then again yesterday, Friday, zero dollars altogether, which means not a single donation since the first day that I was out there. Does anyone ever like to help with donation? I'm on my way up to Best Buy right now. They are. Best Buy right now. And I can try my hand in another day. We're probably having to eat shit. Does anyone ever like to help with donation? I would appreciate it. To give me some kind of uh, idea of who I am and what I've been doing. I sing, I play guitar, drum, bass, and piano. I'm an actor, a dancer, a visual artist, a writer. And I can go on or go into egoistic. You probably don't want to hear that. Does anyone ever like to help? I appreciate it. Coming through and I'm getting on to the next stop. Thank you. Anyone on this side? Anyone on this side? Excuse me? Excuse me? Excuse me? Excuse me? Fuck you, boo! My constitution is that the government and law enforcement sent you. Note this. Those events that happened in Tompkins Square Park, I still have proof. On my camera, my SD card. In broad daylight, the NYPD and Parks Department drove through the park not even 20 minutes before it happened. Or unless the precinct, they encouraged me to leave without a report, even for assault or death. You do the math. My constitution is that. Thank you to the one person that cared to help. So I transfer the queue line from Canal to Cal. For service to J Street, transfer at the next stop, 4 Street, for number 4 train to Borough Hall. For service to J Street. For service to Whitehall, Rectum, Portland, transfer out to the J train to the stops. Make it nearby stops. Once again, transfer at Canal Street to J train. For service to Rectum, Whitehall, Portland. Service to J Street, use the 4 train.
Listen up, ladies and jerks. If you're sick of pre-manufactured, mass-produced reading materials, then check out Cars and Women magazine, North America's premier publication for unpublished and rejected literature from the sticky underbelly of the internet hate machine. You can learn to cook by Monoxus. The year is 1997, roughly, and I'm sitting on the couch watching Emeril Lagasse cook something. I'm a small child, and I have no idea what is going on, but it is engaging. This show is on because my home life hasn't fallen apart yet, and my mother is trying to cook something new for Dad tonight. She succeeds, and Dad brings home McDonald's anyway. I'm a fat child. Dad enjoys his home-cooked meal, and I stuff my face with fries that still hold up today, and a Coke. Later this year, we will go to the movies and see Power Rangers Turbo, and I will overeat popcorn and nachos. Around this age, I try to cook, but it doesn't work. I succeeded in not burning toast, at least. I was supervised. Jump forward to about 2003. My home life fell apart, and mom no longer needs to cook for dad. She is working anyway. I'll be eating a Pop-Tart or something like that for breakfast on the bus to school. Lunch is the mid-tier stuff they serve in the cafeteria mixed with junk from the school store that my friends and I buy. Mountain Dew, Funyuns, and pizza with extra sauce are my food staples now. Grandpa cooks a lot. He's pretty good at it. I still catch a cooking show every once in a while. In fact, I found a little box I had from years ago where I wrote down recipes thinking I was going to be a little chef. Not. Nah. I just play video games and eat garbage. I can make eggs. Scrambled, of course. I once cooked a steak and some boxed mashed potatoes. The steak was well done and chewy. So my teenage years eventually catch up to me, 2005-ish, and I am overweight and no one cooks much anymore since we're all busy. I look in my cabinets and find things to throw together. I do a quick search on the internet to see what I could make with the junk I have. Turns out there are a few things, so I pick one and follow all the instructions exactly. It is fine. Sometime this year, I decide to take a cooking class in school. 
It is one of the few classes I actually attend. The teacher sucks and wants me to follow his instructions, then share the results with the class. This lasts all of one class because I don't want to cook for them. I am cooking for me. I change the recipes and they taste great. The class agrees. Teacher is mad and I got a C due to not following instructions. I learned some of the basics here and I learned that cooking is subjective. My pancakes slap and I don't burn stuff anymore. I am an adult and I work in a restaurant. I do not cook. I pack food up and do preparation for the actual chefs. I am high most of the time and try every single thing the kitchen offers me. And it is all delicious. Most of the time, I'm not very busy, so I watch the chefs. I don't ask questions, I just watch. I learned how the best sauces are made with raw materials and that the time it takes to make them can change the recipe. I learned how to flip food in a saucepan without a spatula. I learned how to make marinades, dressings, breadcrumbs, and how to prepare fresh seafood. I learned the shortcuts that restaurants take to make your food taste good. Lots of butter in your pasta, friends. I learned to make a pizza from the base ingredients, all by watching other people do it. I would go home at night and grab materials to practice. I was getting pretty good at it. We are here. I have since left the food industry and am now working in the world of fitness. I am roughly 40 pounds overweight, but I am not fat. I prepare meals every single week. I can cook almost every dish that I once ordered for delivery. I learned how to make these things by using the techniques I acquired over the years. Look up the ingredients, prepare them and combine. I don't follow recipes. I just know how these things are put together when I see them. I can watch a stupid little 30 seconds Instagram short that shows ingredients and a finished product and make the food. I have never had formal training for most of these skills. People I know praise my cooking and I don't understand it. Nothing I make is special. It is simply combining things in the right order. I have heard that there are people that can't cook. That, my friends, is retarded. He came to my house, he had soup up, I cut that. Yeah, facts. I cut that nigga in his face. I told one of my own, I said, yo, blood. Yo, blood, yo, pass me that scalp, bro. Pass me that scalp, blood. Pass me that scalp. And then cut that nigga right in his face. What are you talking about? And I caught a new charge for that. I had to go to court for all that. I caught a new charge for that. She thought about it. I caught a new charge for that. But fuck it, it was worth it. It was worth it. Faggot ass nigga. That's why I said this bitch, you a faggot nigga. That's why, yeah, nigga, that's why I said, yeah, you gotta go. You a faggot. Fuck you, I got handcuffs on. He was trying to dig in my ass. Yeah, them niggas be faggots, nigga. Fuck you talking about, nigga. Fuck you trying to dig in my ass. What's wrong with you, nigga? They was trying to tell you strip search, I'm gonna get your dick. Yeah, nigga, my dick big, my dick bigger than yours, and I got a big dick. Feel me? And my dick way bigger than yours, nigga. 
So that's why every time I do that, and I don't be jacking that shit either. Nigga, I don't jack y'all searches like that. That's why you tell to do that boost. What are you talking about, nigga? Yeah. Fuck you mean, nigga? I slime that nigga out. Bring my nigga Young Thug and bring my white Gigi, nigga. I slime that nigga out, nigga. Stop playing with me, nigga. What I do for my people, I take care of my people. You know what I'm saying? I do all that, like. I love my people. I love people, like. That's why people love me. Because I love people. I take care of people. Oh, yeah, me get over. Yo. Yo, bro, I'm getting off, you heard? Thank you. Boy, stop right there. I'm about to go buy some Chinese before I'm starving. Fuck this is talking about. Like, niggas trying to come at the homie's head. Like, don't, don't, like, bro, don't come at me, bro. Don't come at me, bro. Don't fucking come at me, my nigga. Don't come at me, yo. Real shit. You know what I mean? He, like, like, even Mr. Gray, Mr. Gray, he always up there. She see me, bro, nigga, she know. She see me, she said, Brown. This and that. She said, Brown, you okay? She said, yeah. I said, Mr. McCray, that nigga wild. She said, yeah, it's all right. You okay? You feel me? What are you talking about? Nigga, Mr. McCray, love me, nigga. The women CEOs love me in jail, nigga. You fuck me now? I could have fucked one of them too. I could have. But, you know what I mean? But, you know, she in the sick building. She not in the parish, but one of them I could have fucked. Yeah, I get pussy in jail, nigga. I don't fuck with men, I fuck with straight women. Women see you be on my dick. And that's a fact. So, your man locked up, you might be fucking the CEO woman, you heard? Cause we get down like that, you heard? <laughs> Thank you, bro. Thank you. <laughs> What's up, ladies and jerks? You like things that don't suck. So for more of the finest garbage this side of Meat Space, come on down to the Trash Radio Patreon. I can't promise that my buttery, trashy voice will stop rearranging things in your living room when you're not home. 